So our final speaker this evening is Dr. Miro Griffiths. He is a research fellow in disability studies and social policy in the University of Leeds and a member of the Disability Advisory Committee of the Equality and Human Rights Commission. Mira will bring us his perspective, as well as giving us some insights regarding the situation in Oregon. Uh, it's oft quoted, of course, as an exemplar for the shape of the proposed legislation, which seems likely to be brought before the Scottish Parliament next year. So Miro, let's hear your presentation and then we'll have an opportunity for some discussion. Thank you. Thank you, David. I'm just gonna share my uh, slides. If you just bear with me. So hopefully people can see, see my slides. Um, so it's a pleasure to be with you. My, my name is uh, Miro Griffiths. Um, and I probably take a, a fairly nuanced position on this panel because not only do I have a background engaging in uh, policy discourse and issues affecting disabled people and people with health conditions and impairments, but I am also a disabled person and I, by uh, UK terminology, would have a condition classed as life limiting. Um, and I rely upon uh, an assemblage of different health uh, interventions um, to keep me alive and to keep my condition as stable as possible as it continues to progress. Um, and I lose various levels of functioning and respiratory uh, ability. Uh, and often as I'm reminded on a daily basis by commissioners and by the narratives highlighted by uh, Professor Bohr, the cost of my care and support is, uh, is an incredible amount. And these are the sort of social issues that we need to consider as we think about and reflect on the uh, opportunity we have in front of us, which is the uh, proposed assisted dying for terminally ill adults uh, in, in Scotland. So what I wanna do in my short presentation, and I should probably say at this point, uh, I can only cover uh, a, a limited amount. So I'm prioritizing some aspects and that doesn't relegate or exclude other aspects. And I encourage us to think about the broader patterns and themes that have been explored across the entirety of the presentations. But I'd like us to think about how we understand health and illness and disability and how the problematic ways in which we conceptualize these issues has affected uh, the, the narratives and the discourses surrounding uh, notions of assisted dying and, and assisted suicide. And then I'm going to draw through some of the key concerns and problems associated with, uh, with such infrastructure and such mechanisms. And that will lead me to highlight some of the main uh, concerns I have specifically with uh, the Scottish bill. And throughout, I'll, I will make reference to Oregon, um, which as, as David has highlighted, is often uh, positioned as a, as a, as a credible option for thinking through it. So I'm gonna highlight some of the concerns here, there as well. And then I'll finally summarize with some key points. But my starting point, and probably one of the most, uh, one of the most overall, well, the overall message I have to give you is that there is a recognition that when we are talking about people with health conditions, uh, impairments, uh, various diagnoses uh, and so on, and include, that includes disabled people as well, we are talking about a community that is experiencing extensive marginalization throughout the life course. And this is particularly pertinent when we think about the legislative creep that may occur or the vagueness that surrounds eligibility to the point where more groups can be included within it. So if you have people who are experiencing marginalization and particularly within areas of healthcare and uh, access to participation in society, this then renders the bill at a very dangerous point. And my argument is that whilst I have deep fundamental problems with the notion of uh, as assisted dying and assisted suicide, I also think the time in which we are debating this is problematic because we are talking about a time when disabled people are still, still experiencing marginalization, but they are also experiencing injustices brought on by a legacy of, uh, of a humanitarian crisis, indeed the pandemic. And my other point here as well, is that when we think about the purpose of government and we think about legislative and policy aspirations, surely 
the focus should be on ensuring that people have sufficient support to live and contribute and participate and be valued in the in society as their health fluctuates and as their health needs and their various needs progress in different directions. So to start with, I want, to want us to think about this notion of terminology. And what I mean by this is that we have to recognize that disabled people are experiencing unnecessary restrictions through policy, through uh, um, external barriers in society, and through the cultural attitudes that we hold. And this is entangled within our view of suffering and within our view of uh, the, the, the unbearableness that surrounds various health conditions and impairments. So we have to think about the purpose and the role of medicine. And what we've discussed so far over the, over the two presentations, and of course in my presentation as well, is that there is a role, an important role for medicine. There is an important role for medical professionals and for health services. And the argument, I think, as a general theme, is that practitioners of medicine are there to stabilize conditions, to support people through the progression of their conditions, and to treat illnesses and issues that may arise due to existing impairments or due to various other aspects. But the question that we have is, should the role of medical professionals now be moved towards facilitating death that is approved by state mechanisms, and possibly in some circumstances, to accelerate one's death as well. So my concerns uh, surrounding assisted suicide fall within these uh, five areas. So firstly, I think there is some deep concerns around the notion of, of individual autonomy here and how there is an emphasis placed on the individual over the collective. And of course, when we think about the importance of legislation and policy, we are making decisions that are going to have social impacts on the way in which we behave and the way in which we live our lives and value each other and so on. So we shouldn't be making decisions on the basis of policy and legislation for the individual and I may say anecdotal experiences of, of individuals. Now, whilst I'm not denying the importance of the individual experience, I am thinking about the purpose of legislation and policy, which is to have substantial collective impact on the way in which society is organized. But there's also something here as well in terms of shifting social uh, attitudes. And what we have through uh, assisted suicide and dying mechanisms seen throughout the world, an example would be Oregon, for example, is this emphasis that support and the need for support as our lives change becomes perceived as undesirable. And it is perceived perhaps by some as being a burden. And this then relegates the lives of certain people to be within this constant narrative that their lives should be questioned, that their life expectancy should be constantly assessed, and, the, and perhaps that life is not worth living. So you have problems here in the way in which the social attitudes towards disabled people and people with health conditions will be altered by the implementation of assisted suicide mechanisms, whereby the emphasis of assisted suicide becomes a preference over and above the various different interventions that may be possible and may be preferable if there wasn't this constant narrative that support is undesirable and that people's life changes and the ways in which we live our life may alter over time. And we can see, for example, in the literature surrounding Oregon, where uh, individuals have highlighted these, these narratives of burden of sparing families and individuals um, in order to, to justify the intervention of assisted suicide. And of course, of perhaps removing alternative forms of provision because assisted suicide then becomes a value, valuable option given the issues of cost or given this notion of the fear of what one's life will become. As they, as they progress. There's also something here about the, the potential increase and the broadening of criteria. And what you have, uh, I think, uh, simpli to, to argue this simplistically, you have situations that take two avenues. So you have one where the criteria is very specific in cases across the globe, 
where the legislation is very specific about who is eligible for assisted suicide. And this creates then pressure by those who continue to campaign and by the various different groups who occupy a pro position, who are arguing for different uh, eligibility criteria, different groups of people to be eligible and so on. So you see legislative creep happening where there is strict criteria and therefore groups are permitted through changes in, in legislation um, or amendments. Or the other, other avenue of direction is where the language and the, um, the articulation of need is so incredibly vague that more and more groups then uh, seek to be permitted. And it happens. So again, what you see in Oregon, for example, is an expansion of the, of the medical conditions that allow for, uh, for groups to be, to, be, uh, to be perceived as having terminal conditions. And this includes endocrine and metabolic diseases. It includes the expansion into gastrointestinal diseases and so on. And these are conditions that are not perceived as being terminal. So there's a concern here about how we understand uh, the expansion criteria. And what you have again within Oregon is an example here whereby between 1999 and 2020, you have an 807% increase in the number of people choosing to die through assisted suicide per annum since the law was introduced. And when we think about the rationale given for why people want to access assisted suicide, you see the emphasis placed on the fear of living. And I think uh, Professor Bohr's articulation of that point is, uh, is exceptionally important within our, within our narratives here. It is the fear of what one's life will become that is driving the mechanisms. And when you think about the fear of what your life will become against the backdrop of social inequality, of restricted uh, life chances, of withdrawal or denied access to various levels of support to participate and to live and exist in society. We can understand why these concerns are being raised by people. So the notion of, uh, say, for example, in the uh, Washington State Death with Dignity Act data from 2018, when people were giving it the reason of being a burden on family, friends, and caregivers, and that is 51% of people um, who, are, who, are, who are opting for this approach of end of life. What you have here is a realization that the infrastructure to support people is incredibly residual. It is bare minimum. And therefore people are relying upon family and relying upon social networks to have their needs met. So you can see this being replicated within the UK and within the Scottish context because the same concerns surrounding inequalities for disabled people are, are, are in existence. The same concerns around the lack of support to live a life on the basis of value on the basis of having a prominent position in society is not, is not uh, realized. And I also think there's something here about the, the inadequate training that is provided. So when we think about the safeguards, and I will come on to the safeguards shortly, but when we think about the safeguards that are being proposed in the Scottish bill, there is a considerable lack of clarity around how one assesses uh, in order to make the decision of, of whether somebody is in an informed state of mind to make a decision. There's concerns here about the way in which people and the health profession have been trained. And when there is reference to new training emerging, this is incredibly vague. And there's also, I think, another important point to make here, which is the implications for the relationship between patients and practitioners. And I say that because the way in which we commission our services across the UK is to ensure that health professionals are very much present within the decision making about access to support. And if we think about ourselves as citizens, how often are we reminded about the cost of our support and, and access to treatment? We are reminded of the cost if we miss appointments. We are reminded of the cost of expensive treatments when they become available to us. So if you think about this in relation to assisted dying, we have a very dangerous situation where, where we are starting to judge and value people's existence on the basis of how much they cost uh, to, to have their life supported. But you then, with the introduction of assisted suicide, get the option of saying, well, your cost associated with assisted suicide, perhaps by some uh, literature and data, will be signif significantly less than longer term support as your needs progress and as you move towards end of life. 
Now, if I move on to the next slide, my concerns with the with the particularities of the of the uh, Scottish Bill are, are quite extensive. Firstly, I think there are some deep concerns about the inclusion and exclusion criteria. So, how one is judged to have a particular condition that meets the category, um, I think, is incredibly vague, and I think it will relate back to the problems with uh, with the Oregon uh, situation, as I just referenced. But I also think there's some issues with the measurements as well. So not only do I think there are concerns about the transparency and accountability and the monitoring of the decisions that are, that are made surrounding assisted suicide mechanisms, but if we think about the safeguards that are proposed in the bill, I think that there is such vagueness around how doctors uh, determine an individual's capacity. So it's measured on the basis of feeling unsure. So we're asking for the subjective value of a doctor to determine whether they think that somebody is not in a good position to, to, make this, to make such decisions. There's also, I think, an absence and vagueness surrounding uh, how to assess for uh, absence of pressure or coercion in order to make decisions. Well, how does one do that, particularly when the data suggests that doctors struggle in order to make this decision? And of course, there is a considerable, considerable point of concern when we think about the disagreement between doctors, because as the bill proposes, if there is a disagreement, then the question is, well, then what? And what you have then is a process where we will cycle through doctors to find those who are most agreeable to assisted dying. This is particularly highlighted in, in, in point 3.3 point three of the bill. So what you have, and this is again reflected in the, in, the, uh, in the Oregon situation, is whereby certain individuals become concentrated in the process of offering assisted suicide. A reduced number of people are, the, uh, are involved in signing off the prescriptions of validating the declaration or the, uh, the request and application for assisted suicide. So my argument is all of the safeguards in the bill are ineffective, particularly because of that point outlined in 3.3. If a doctor is unhappy or is in disagreement, the process is to find the, a next doctor to, who will then be able to make a decision. And where there is concerns that need to be offered to an assessment process, such as bringing in um, a, a, a professional assessment to determine capacity. Of course, we are looking at this within a context where people are struggling to access support on a daily basis. So we are in a, concern, in, in a dangerous situation where those who are seeking to, to die and have their deaths facilitated by the state will be accelerated in accessing support from those who will be able to make a judgment whether they have capacity and whether there is an absence of pressure and coercion. Whereas those who want to live their life and are trying desperately to find support to live their life are denied opportunities or have to wait an extensive amount of time. I also think there is something here about um, what I refer to as the pandemic analogy. So in terms of thinking about my condition and the way in which my condition affects uh, the prognosis of whether I will, I will live or die. If you think about it in the context of the pandemic, is the likelihood of my death linked to my impairment or health condition? Or is the likelihood of my death linked to the fact that I may have a lack of support, resources, infrastructure to be protected during a pandemic? So when we think about that in the context of assisted suicide, the question is, is somebody's uh, prognosis and the likelihood of their death linked to that condition? Or is it due to the fact that many people struggle to access health and social care support, struggle to access various health interventions and technologies that may be incredibly uh, significant to ensuring that their life um, is, 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 a, is of a considerable length of time, particularly as people's needs change as well. As I said before, the, my concerns around the infrastructure, I think there are doubts here around how to uh, identify clear and settled intentions, particularly when there is then a need to opt into uh, specialist assessments. And I also think there is concerns, particularly around 4.3, and the resource implications are ultimately meaningless. There is no clarification as to how to embed training, support, transition to new arrangements, given that we have deep uh, problems within our health service of meeting existing demands and the concerns that surround people trying to access support to live their life as things are. 
And this current social position of disabled people shouldn't be denied here either. There are problems in the way in which people articulate their lives, and these are deep problems and, and problems that must be acknowledged. But often, we should think about this within the broader position that disabled people are in. And what I mean by that is feelings of being a burden, feelings of being useless in society. We have a history where disabled people and people with health conditions are positioned as being undesirable, as being problematic, as being unproductive to society. And these feelings and narratives and cultural aspects that surround disability and health conditions and impairment will be reflected within assisted dying mechanisms as well. Now I've touched on many of these Oregon concerns already, but just to emphasize some key points here as well. So as I said, I think there, that whilst there may be the argument that, uh, the, that the legislative creep is not, is not visible in uh, the Oregon situation, although I would push back against that. Nevertheless, we have seen an increase of 807% uh, of increase in the number of people choosing to die. There is also here, I think, this interesting statement made by the Oregon Health Authority, which determines that the, the bill does, the, the legislation in Oregon does not compel patients to have exhausted all treatment options first or to continue with current treatments. So when you have the option of assisted suicide, which then becomes, as I think in the previous presentation, uh, as it was outlined in the previous presentation, may become a first choice or a first line of treatment. The problem that we have is that people then, whilst they may be presented with this notion of choice, are moving towards the, the idea of assisted suicide as a desirable option, as an option that is more, is, is, is more preferred over, over alternative forms of treatment. As I said, the concentration issue. So you, here you have, in 2020, 142 doctors in Oregon uh, wrote, wrote the 370 prescriptions. That means you have a range of one to 31 prescriptions per doctor. So as I said, the, as the bill stands, Ensuring that, that people can opt out, uh, pr practitioners can opt out, creates a situation where all the safeguards are meaningless because you have a system where you just find those who are more agreeable, who are perhaps uh, more uh, aligned with the pro arguments associated with, with assisted suicide. So in summary, what my argument is, is that we have to acknowledge the social inequalities that surround disabled people's lives and people with health conditions. And these will play a factor in the way in which people judge and value their own life, their own opportunities and the prognosis of their own health conditions. And of course, this has been exacerbated by the pandemic. But there are also, I think, concerns here about the way in which we understand legislation and policy. And as I have said often in many of the debates that surround assisted suicide, we have reached a point now where we are debating dignity in death before there is dignity in life. And surely the emphasis should be on ensuring that we have policies and legislation that ensure that disabled people are valued, that people with health conditions are valued, that they have prominent opportunities to participate in society as their health changes over time. And this should be available and realized before you have these options and mechanisms on the table. My final point, is that I believe that this bill is, is unsafe. I believe it's, un, it's very dangerous. And I think it is not being considered alongside the widespread inequalities faced by people with health conditions, impairments, and uh, disabilities. And I'll stop there. Good, <clears throat> Miro, thank you very much for that. I've been uh, carefully monitoring the questions as they've been coming in and we've got loads of questions there's plenty of material for discussion here folks but the last contributor just said Miro you made an excellent and cogent argument thank you and I would echo that and the, the same applies for Leone so I've got questions for both of you from our audience and uh, if there's time I might interject one or two of my own but uh, let me start Leone if I may with you if you don't mind so um, you demonstrated parallel to the Dutch experience, a fairly dramatic increase in numbers in Canada, again with regional variation. And perhaps we'll come back to that issue, but my, my question or my group of questions here concern the impact on those who are involved in the process. So first of all, what about the impact on doctors who've been involved in 
euthanasia? And is there, is there evidence uh, to support any concerns that we might have about uh, the impact on the medical staff involved in this? Yeah, so there's more evidence from countries who have been uh, doing this longer than Canada. I don't think we have um, good studies yet in Canada that are looking at um, made professional um, demoralization and um, moral distress. But uh, from the Netherlands and the Belgium studies, we do know that um, there's a, there is even those who are in favor of euthanasia and provide it uh, do experience a degree of um, moral distress and moral injury. And some people have stopped providing that used to provide before. Um, I don't know that we have all the evidence that we need to better understand. Um, what it is that um, they're experiencing, but uh, definitely some um, complex uh, moral distress. And I, I guess like uh, many people on our session this evening, some of us have been somewhat alarmed at the evidence of state compulsion in some areas of Europe right now. And so, Leone, again, just to stay with you for a moment, is there an opt-out for doctors and nurses in Canada? And have you ever yourself been forced or been put in a difficult position about this issue, uh, you know, being requested to administer. Uh, yeah, so the, the legislation doesn't require uh, anyone to give the lethal injection yourself, uh, but there's no protection from you being forced to facilitate and participate in it in some way, for example, by finding a provider who will do it for the patient, um, if you're not willing to do it yourself, um, for being helping with the paperwork, things that would be, uh, for some people, would be against their professional integrity, that this is in the best interest of the patient, especially when in Canada you have it for reasons that people are lonely and isolated and uh, they haven't tried treatments that you know can alleviate their suffering. As I said, it can become an, a first-line option in that sense. So uh, for many physicians, it would be even if they're in favor of euthanasia, it would, it would often be the case that this is not something they feel uh, they can participate in. And so there's no protection from that piece. There is, um, uh, it's the actual act of doing it itself. No one is forced to do the injection, but there are many different types of participation that cause uh, moral distress and um, cause people to go against their conscience, yeah. Okay. Let me, let me turn, Miro, if I may, to you. Uh, you spoke very convincingly about what appears to be evidence of increasing acceptance, perhaps, perhaps relaxation of the indications that, that there are maybe in the Dutch experience, I know there's been some concern about the laxity in recording and registration. Uh, you talked about cost. What do you think, what do you think are the principal concerns, the major factors relating to this kind of what you might call mission creep, I suppose? Well, I think it, it, re it relates back to um, the points I, I, I made surrounding uh, the inconsistencies in campaigns and, our, and uh, narratives surrounding those who are, who are pro uh, uh, this legislation. So often we have seen different impairment groups argue and articulate based on their personal experiences uh, why there should be justification. So Typically, what you have found in every situation where there has been uh, assisted suicide legislation, the continued pressure to offer a way in for more and more groups. And I think that this shouldn't be a surprise because it reflects the, the narratives that have been around for many years about why there should be justification for this. But it also ignores the systemic and grave violations that are affecting disabled people and people with health conditions. And we can't lose sight of that. So when you have the United Nations Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities in their thematic report, I think within uh, around 2020, highlighting the impact of ableism in medical and scientific practice and links very deep concerns about assisted suicide and euthanasia and so on. Uh, you have a situation where there are there is widespread condemnation, but there is also this continued pressure by campaigners, and the legislative creep will occur if you don't have a situation where the alternative is, as I as I articulated, a situation where the the language 
is so vague surrounding eligibility that the pressure to include more categories as uh, as defined as terminal ill uh, becomes a realization. So, for example, you know, I think about my own condition, one where the you could argue that my life, um, my death will be um, driven by my impairment um, of a neuromuscular condition that causes severe muscle weakness and respiratory uh, uh, failure and decrease. But alternatively, and my position as a sociologist would be, I think that my death will likely occur because of an arrangement of different issues that includes a lack of support, uh, the, the constant fights and battles I have to have in order to access healthcare and technologies, and the constant pressure that I have to resist when I engage with medical professionals in a crisis where they have questions about, should we place do not resuscitate notices? Should we discuss options for, uh, for what may happen if we need to uh, think about withdrawing support and so on? So these situations are very vivid. And as I said right at the beginning, we shouldn't be driven by the personal stories whilst they are very important. Yeah. We need to think about the collective impact of yes. policy and legislation. Yes. Yes, Mira, just before I go back to Leone, you mentioned concerns about safeguards. Do you think, as you, you've analysed this whole position clearly in some detail, do you think there's a workable solution that would satisfy those concerns? Uh, well, I've been involved in these debates for many years, um, in, in particularly, uh, again, in, in, in with regard to um, Westminster government as well. I cannot think of any situation where any of the, of the safeguards will be to an extent that will address the concerns raised by people. And the point that we often find ourselves in is that those who are highlighting concerns are dismissed. Issues of scaremongering, issues of um, you know, you know, articulating very wild accusations and so on. But if those who are, who are supporting this bill believe that it works, then they should be able to systematically address all the concerns outlined by the three of us tonight in our, in our presentations and in other campaigning groups. But they don't, because often the situation, effect, the, the outcome is, to, is just to dismiss the concerns. So as I said in my presentation, I don't think the safeguards work, particularly because as you've seen in Oregon and in other places around the world, you have a situation where if there is disagreement, people can go and seek another alternative opinion from somebody else. And when there are questions about assessing capacity and decision-making and so on, they are relying on mechanisms that are so vague that they are meaningless. Yeah, thank you. Leone, do you have information about how many made requests are actually declined? Uh, so there is some reporting on that by uh, the government of Canada, but... Um, Again, like the, the the monitoring and reporting of made is left up to the uh, the subjective um, will of the made provider. So there's no kind of oversight mechanism. So we only know what made providers choose to tell us, and they submit their reports. So I don't know that that data is accurate in a sense of how many of made providers would submit a report online, which is you know it's a lot of hassle to say this person requested made and I didn't approve them. Um, so I don't think that we have accurate data in that regard. Um, anecdotally, it's, it's, it's not common that someone who requests me doesn't get it, um, but the numbers aren't um, very reliable. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Certainly there, there does appear to be, from my reading of the literature too, a, a sense in which uh, an element of laxity kind of creeps in and familiarity perhaps with the process and so Maybe that leads to human cutting of corners or whatever. Here's a, here's a question for you. Now, this is, this is to someone who clearly has experience, Leone, of a situation where you have both euthanasia and assisted suicide available. Uh, now, clearly with some of the information that Theo passed on and the material that you referred to, this question's, question asks, do you think it would be a better option to only offer euthanasia and forget about assisted suicide, which appears to be the kind of purpose that's out for consultation in the proposed Scottish legislation. What do you think? So I, I think that uh, as it goes back to the safeguard question that you just asked Miro. I think that neither option 
uh, can have safeguards that are enacted that would prevent someone from having death wrongfully done to them because they didn't have access to the care they needed or because there was pressure or coercion that wasn't detected. Um, so I, I think regardless of whether it's euthanasia or assisted suicide, the issue is around, can it be done safely to prevent harm to vulnerable people? And I think the answer based on the Canadian experience and on the Dutch experience, and I would say on the Belgium experience is no, that there are no safeguards that can be put in place that have stringent enough rules and oversight um, that can detect things like subtle pressure. And it is left to um, the subjective interpretation of uh, what a person feels their suffering is and whether that particular maid provider agrees. And as Miro has said, um, there's a smaller group and a smaller and smaller group over time of people who provide need. And we do see doctor shopping. You're allowed to go uh, to as many doctors as it takes to get to assessors who agree. Uh, that you can get made and so there's a there's a lot of um, problems with with safeguards and oversight yeah now, you're, you're a palliative care physician yeah so so what about those who would say well yeah we see the importance of having enhanced palliative care we ought to invest in palliative care but why don't we retain assisted suicide or euthanasia for that matter as an option as well so we have a menu of options and we can tailor it to the particular needs of of the patient yeah, I think I would I would refer back to something Professor Bohr said. There's never been a, a time more in in history where we need it need it less. We have come so far in palliative medicine and being able to take to take care of pain and other symptoms. Um, but so from a from a you know just a, a physical uh, necessity, there's no need for anything other than really good uh, palliative care. Uh, but those aren't the reasons people request euthanasia, right? And so it is all of this other stuff that Mira was getting up that the value and the dignity of the human life and how we support people in dignity and living, uh, that is a real cultural issue that needs to be addressing, needs to be addressed, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Here's a question just come in actually, which, uh, which asks, so what do you think about the fact that public opinion appears to consistently show public support for assisted suicide. Should we ignore the majority view? What do you think about that? Perhaps Miro will turn to you for a, an answer to that one. So the, the, the wave, the sort of tide of public opinion seems to be running in a, in a particular direction. Can we stand in the face of that with logical argument? I mean, you've certainly given us some logical arguments tonight, but what about the weight of majority opinion or what appears to be the majority opinion? Well, my, my first response is always to, to question how um, how existing data that gauges public opinion is supposed to represent a considerable number of people. So, for example, in the in the consultation for the bill, I, I see the reference made to various uh, data sources. Um, and of course, when you drill down into those numbers, you're talking about a survey responses of, of a thousand people or so. Uh, and that is supposed to reflect then uh, disabled people who, from the latest figures, and I think will be conservative, uh, constitutes a million disabled people in Scotland. So I don't know how you can generalize findings to that level. There's also, I, I think, a, a, a problem and a concern here. Um, so, for example, I remember reading some arguments that suggested disabled people's organizations are supporting of this. And there has been a reluctance by certain disabled people's organizations to state a position on this. But we should remember that reluctance doesn't imply neutrality. And so I think there's, there's something here about how we have to acknowledge the, the, the broader patterns of injustice and social inequality that are facing disabled people. So we have disabled people who are experiencing hate speech, hate crime, lack of support, questions around why do don't, why don't, why don't disabled people exist? These will be reflected in the bill. So whilst you may have so certain levels of data that suggest that some people may be supportive of this. My, my argument to politicians and policymakers is that whilst it is indeed important to be uh, made aware of social issues and problems, your role and your responsibility is to critique and assess this beyond the personal opinion and to, to be rooted in the evidence and the data that surrounds the social topics that we're talking about. 
And if, this, if the evidence and the data based on today and based on the, the broader system, uh, systematic literature reviews that one can do is highlighting all these concerns, then I say that we need to be cautious about being led by public opinion. Yeah. We have a responsibility to think about the broader implications of the decisions that we make through legislation and policy that will have a substantial impact and legacy within society. And that's why I would always employ any policymaker, and, I, and I've spent many years as a policy advisor to governments across, the, across Europe. I would always say that your first instance is not to react immediately and support the public opinion. It's to take a hold of their concerns and then to make judgments based on evidence and yeah. based on literature. Yeah, I think if, I'm, right. if sorry, I may Ian, jump in, yeah, sorry if that's okay. Um, not that I can add anything to that uh, brilliant uh, summary, Miro, thank you. Uh, but just to say that I don't think that the public really understands in general what we're talking about. And I mentioned in my uh, remarks that Many people think that stopping uh, life-sustaining treatments or burden, you know, things that have become no longer a benefit to a person is assisted dying or is euthanasia. They also think what we do in palliative care uh, is euthanasia. And, and I still, even five years into legalization in Canada, every week in my work, I, I encounter a patient or a family who thinks that euthanasia or assisted dying is something else like those two things I'm talking about. So I think there's a, even some recent polls in the UK that show that the public thinks that's what we're talking about when we say assisted dying. So, so do they actually understand that we're talking about a lethal injection or a lethal dose of drug to immediately end someone's life? I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. So there were a couple of questions earlier on about the, about the actual medications that are being used. And of course, there's no, as I understand it, no uniformity around the different, many and different jurisdictions where this is active in some form. But let's just focus, if I may, maybe come to you, Leone, and look at the assisted suicide issue. What are your thoughts about the medications in terms of their effectiveness? Is this something which uniformly produces a trouble-free, dignified death? Um, what about clinical studies on the different options that might be available? Is there any kind of strong message appearing in relation to the actual techniques and or agents being used? Yeah, so, so I will disclose I'm not an expert in this area. It's not something I choose to practice in. I am familiar with the literature. Um, and I think there, that is the reason that's led to most jurisdictions now offering the euthanasia backup option, including, you know, we're seeing that in um, California, coming in California, as well as in Washington, uh, where, there are a number it's of incomplete assisted suicides uh, and that then they want to provide euthanasia to complete the act, so to speak. So there are difficulties with self-administration and it can be the reports of it being a very prolonged, protracted um, death. And so not necessarily as comfortable as it's made to seem, uh, which is why I think we have a higher number when given the option, uh, euthanasia becomes the easy option for patients because it's medicalized, it's a doctor who does it, it's it's kind of very clean and um, you know uh, reliable. And so I think it also one has to wonder, and we don't know have time to get into this, uh, if it's easier to have something done to you than to do it to yourself, which is a philosophical question. Well, listen, we, we promised our audience that we would be finished by 8 p.m. and I'm determined as chairman not to lose my reputation so to deliver that end. Someone has just made the comment however that uh, just in relation to the public opinion issue uh, so often these questionnaires or opinion polls are, are rather unsophisticated and when people then are presented with a rather more nuanced or realistic set of arguments and reality the opinion polls don't necessarily show informed public opinion at all, but I think we need to end it there. It's uh, one minute to eight. So let me just say to everyone who's involved uh, how stimulating this has been. It's been a really good session. I'm grateful to our speakers today, to Theo, to Leone and to Miro. And on your behalf, I'd like to thank each of them sincerely for the effort and energy they've invested in highlighting the various issues that came through. And thank you to all the delegates, for those of you who connected in and who asked questions. Uh, I apologize if we didn't get to every every question time was not really on our side there 
but I can tell you that it might well be worth your while visiting the carenotkilling.scot website. There you can register for their newsletter. You'll be notified when the next Holyrood webinar will be taking place. And so with that, let me just offer my thanks, wish you all a very good evening, and to say that this concludes today's webinar. So thank you all very much indeed. <laughs>